Hi, welcome back to the next episode of The Keto Naturopath. I'm Dr. Carl Goldcamp on YouTube. So today I wanted to go into back to the protein sparing modified fast and really take it down level by level by level because you can make this such a, pro, a precise metabolic transition for you, whether you're af after weight loss, fat loss, building muscle, uh, sarcopenia, it just general immune health. It's spectacular, but we'll take it down from a beginner's level down to, I think, I would probably say that advanced expert if you need labels for these particular things, okay? So I put together some research, some main points. I tried to really just keep it to five points, but I'll elaborate on all five, okay? So let's, let's get going. All right, so the four levels of precision, protein sparing modified fast, PSMF, and a bonus level at the end. Let's get going. All right, so level one is like, where to begin when people ask? Well, focus is, how do we do a basic protein sparing modified fast? That's all we're gonna be doing. All right, so step one, of course, is start focusing by increasing your protein per day and trim the fat or choose lean cuts of meat, poultry, fish, and seafood. The easiest way to do this is to start tracking your diet at least your macros. This means you'll be increasing your other macro, you'll be de decreasing your other macronutrients as you transition. So this is a, a snapshot of chronometer, which is what we use. And this is how I track my clients and patients as well. I get to see, peek over their shoulders because I'm allowed to look into their daily tracking to find out how they're doing. But this is how it is. Here's your calories up top, your protein, your carbs, and your fats. And so the green bar is the one that we're gonna be increasing on. Okay, so that's pretty much step one. What else? Focus, three to five days per week, you're gonna have lean protein only. So that's lean meat, that's chicken without the skin, that's sardines, that's just an example of the seafood. And I could go on, but these are the actual foods that you'll be having. You notice that wasn't a ribeye, or if it was a ribeye, it would be, the meat would be cut off, okay? Or it was pork, the meat would be cut off, and the meat would be cut off, the fat would be cut off, okay? All right, in order to make this a sustainable for the long run, here's something you really need to know about. It's actually a disclaimer. So by itself, a protein sparing modified fast is not 100% nutrition. That is, it is, deficient. PSMF is nutritionally deficient by itself, therefore needs to be combined with either what I call organ meats, which is liver and or egg yolks, or you're going to take some sort of multiple vitamin. So this is an example of your choices. Here's a multiple vitamin from Thorne. That's all the stuff that would be in a good multi, so you can compare it to the one you're taking. Here's liver and there's egg yolk. I love liver pate and the other things we do liver. Judy's not a big fan of liver, but you know, I, it, it works for me and you make it more and more special. So does it have to be beef liver? Does it have to be calves liver? No, that is the most nutritious. Make it chicken liver. You can make it goose liver, which is foie gras, uh, a whole story behind that, but make it work for you. It is the most nutrient dense substance on earth. Okay, and there's egg yolks, and a lot you can do with egg yolks, and you've seen through our cooking part of Judy what she's done. Okay, you'll need to have organ meats, liver, or egg yolks on your non-PSMF days to make sure you're getting your fat-soluble vitamins. Seriously, it's a big deal. The reason I say this obvious point is because some people are going to go, I'm going to go two months and just do protein-sparing modified fast, and they're going to get themselves into trouble. So if they're not going to alter their diet to include these other forms of food, then they're going to have to think about a multiple vitamin, all right? Don't get yourself into trouble. Don't think you're going to outsmart everybody. All right, tools to use is basically a food scale and a diet tracker. So we use chronometer. This is what chronometer looks like. There's your calendar. You put in your foods. And it's actually a very useful tool, and we'll explore this just a little bit. But this is the basics of what you need. And no, you do not need to measure every meal. You measure it once and you're done for the rest of your life. So you probably just need this particular scale uh, the first week, the first couple days, depending on what you're eating, depending on what you're preparing yourself, okay? All right, here's an example. Weigh your whole food source of protein on your food scale. It's right there. So we did ours, that's pork on 
232 grams and you can change the grams to ounces underneath the scale. There's a lot of scales you can use. This is the one we're using. An example, 232 grams of pork loin. The setting for food scale is in grams. Um, and so now we go to the food tracking app to find out, well, how much protein is actually in that pork that we're having? And so here's an example of that. According to this, 85 grams of roast pork loin, which is what this is, trimmed of visual fat equals 24.3 grams of protein. You've heard me mention this before on previous videos, but I want to be very clear and unequivocal of every little thing, because questions have come up about this. So let's continue. All right, this is right from Chronometer. We looked up the pork and it says, okay, there's 85 grams of protein, uh, 24, sorry, in every, every, in every 85 grams of protein, which is the equivalent of three ounces, there will be 24 grams of actual protein. Let's say 85 grams of the pork line will equal 24 grams of protein. So with that, we then can calculate in 232 grams of the pork, which is what we measured right here, there's a total of 66 grams of protein. All right. I didn't tell you what you require. I'm just saying get to measure. Get to learn these two tools. That's your first step. You learn how much protein is in the thing you're about to eat, and you've learned how to measure it. And if you want to track, which I suggest you do track on chronometer or whatever your favorite thing is, please do that. This is a great source to use these two. You get these two tools down, that's step one. Let's keep going. Here's some other examples. Here's our, obviously our skinless uh, broiled uh, chicken breast. And here's what's in the chicken breast, pretty much the same as the pork loin, loin for three ounces, which is 85 grams. There's 26 grams of protein. So that means in that entire 318 grams of that big chicken, skinless chicken breast, there's 97 grams of protein. All right, pretty straightforward. You get this down, you're gonna sail through the rest. If you stumble over this and choose not to do this because it's not a hack, um, you'll be forever lost and you'll get confused. And it's just, just please get this down. All right, level two now, intermediate, we're amping it up. How do you do a specific protein amount per day? How do you do a specific protein amount per day? We haven't talked about that. We've just talked about if you can weigh and you can identify what you're eating and know how much protein is that thing that you're eating, that sets us free for the rest of what we have to do, okay? Okay, calculate your ideal body weight. Here's the second disclaimer. The second disclaimer is, I'm not telling you to weigh this amount. I'm not telling you to weigh your ideal body weight. See this as a huge average of everybody who lives in the West, that's Western Europe and United States, Canada, Humanity in general, probably. It's just a term. You could call it something else, but people would go, oh, ideal body weight, I wouldn't weigh that. Well, I don't weigh that either. I don't really care what you weigh. If you weigh five times your ideal body weight, I'm fine with that. If you weigh half, you're probably dead. Um, so it's just a reference. It's a coefficient that we're gonna use to calculate how much protein you need per day how much protein you need per day using this number. So don't be offended by it. It had to be called something, okay? So this number does not represent what you should weigh. It does not represent what you should weigh. It is merely used to calculate your daily protein requirement. Okay, good. Now we're done with that. So here's two charts that I put together. And by the way, this is not rocket science yet. You can go on Google and go ideal body weight for woman, man, height, and we're just doing height and gender at this point. You're gonna say, what about age? We'll get to that in a second. But right now, it's gender and height. So we're gonna use a woman, five foot, four inches, that's 64 inches, and I put these charts together using every other inch to kind of compress it all. So that's our, that's our example. Example, a woman, five foot, four inches, and for a man, example is gonna be 5'10", that's basically me, a little shorter actually. Okay, 5'4", five, 5'10", five, we find their ideal body weight, don't get offended, it's not about you weighing this. For a woman, five feet, four inches is 125 pounds. We're gonna use the 125 pounds because 
our measurement for how much protein we need per day is one gram per pound of ideal body weight. So that means this woman has to have a hundred and she has to have as a goal 125 grams of protein per day. So now you know how to calculate your protein. You know how to identify how much protein is in the thing you're eating, the chicken breast, the meat, the whatever it is you're looking up, right? That's done. So this is going to be easy. And the male is 162,510. I don't weigh that either, by the way. All right. So now use this number to calculate how much protein you need per day. 125 grams of protein per day, 162 grams of protein per day. By the way, that one gram per pound of protein per day equals 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So if you're in the metric system, all of Europe and Canada and everybody but the United States, um, that's probably how you'll be thinking. And that's how it's referenced in various research articles and so on. Okay, so this is the amount of protein you need to have per day. So what's the big surprise? The big surprise is, just like the conversations over the past 70 years, it's been way under-recommended in terms of protein. So when they say North America or the West, it's an over-consumer of protein, they're so far from the truth. I've read that two or three times and there's no statistical analysis to support that. Um, anyway. So here's the range, and this is research taken from uh, Dr. L uh, Donald Lehman, PhD. So here's the range, the low end recommended, which has been recommended is 0.8, don't believe it. Shoot for the high end. So 2.2 grams per kilogram is just under the max that's uh, Dr. Uh, Lehman talks about. And it's been referenced in a number of other articles as well, but it's a nice, it's a nice reference. You can see it visually. Okay. Now about getting older. So if you're like me, or older, or even younger, so I'm 65, so you're older 65, for really over your 25, what happens is that it is more difficult for you to eat the protein you need, actually. Step one, your appetite tends to go down with age. And the other is it's harder to generate muscle mass. So as you get older, you have to make up the difference. And so this is one of the references. Here's it from a study back in, what's the year on this? 2015, not that long ago. The difference of being younger and older, I'm just being very quick. I'm not gonna lock up in the numbers here, but you can see uh, this is on a per meal basis, which is not how I think, by the way, because I'll show you how I do it. But you can see that it's a lot higher. 0 0.10, it's almost, uh, it's well over 50% higher. So that's just something as we all get older that has to be compensated for. So if you know you need to eat more protein as you get older, eat more protein. And now just pick your sources. So if you're wondering, well, why is that? Well, certainly as we get older, there's just changes. But think of all the, your appetite decreases. That makes it twice as hard to eat that kind of protein. And as you eat protein, your appetite becomes less because you're more satiated. But if you throw in environmental factors, et cetera, et cetera, so you have to discipline yourself to an extent as you get older, my age, to make sure what does that amount of protein look like? And how can I have that on a daily basis? Once you calculate it, since you now know how to calculate it, and you go, here's all the stuff I need to eat, and you realize it's not that much, and I'll show you. But just know that. It's a little bit of academic exercise to get out of the way first, but it's it will serve you very well for 25 to 125. How's that? Okay. All right, here's where it starts to get interesting. Level three, advanced, focus. How to do a protein timing per day to increase your muscle protein synthesis in a protein sparing modified fast. Okay, now we have the amount. Now is there, we're asking the question, is there a more strategic way of doing it, an optimal way of doing it throughout the day? And the answer is yes. You don't have it all in one meal. You have it throughout the day. So some of you are going, well, what about OMAD? I like to do OMAD. If you want to do OMAD one meal a day, do OMAD. It isn't breaking a rule. Do not see this as etched in stone. This is making life work for you. So if you have a reason to want to build muscle, to drop fat loss, then pay attention. If you don't, I really don't care what you do. So have OMAD if that's what you want. I tend to have at least three or four snack meat, you know, most of it's at dinner around 5.30, 6 o'clock. Um, let's get into it. 
Okay, what we call as we get older, it's anabolic resistance. 25 forward, certainly it's pronounced after age 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, da, 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 da. Well, this is what happens is when your protein synthesis is decreased and your protein breakdown is increased. And there's certain things that you can do to level up, if you will, level up your protein building. And it is very important. Protein, muscle mass is the number one correlation for all cause mortality. And I can go on and on and on about that. And that just means it's, it's not keep you from falling. It's about uh, decreased risk of cancers, decreased risk of accident, accidents, decreased risk of autoimmune issues, on and on it goes. Okay, so that's our issue, my age and older, and 40 and older, and 25 and older, but it's basically anybody over 40 should be able to see this in themselves. So what the first thing you can do, the first thing you can do is have the appropriate amount of protein that you now know how to calculate, right? One gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. Well, that suddenly is now going to make the MPS, protein, muscle protein synthesis, higher. So now you've equaled it out a little bit by doing just that one thing. Just that one thing's a big deal. So three, eating three times a day here, and you just increased. Let's go further. Here's from a study, I forgot to reference it. Um, so 20 grams of protein maximally stimulates muscle protein synthesis after resistance exercise in young men. And it basically showed here's, you know, so we're talking about ballpark 20 grams of protein, 20 grams of protein. It doesn't necessarily mean a protein drink or a protein slurry. You could have had a chicken breast, right? That would have been about, I don't know, a third of that chicken breast that I show you. What else? So what we do to make it real, what we do here in this house, our eating window is this. We get up, we go work out, get up at five, check the emails, go work out, come back, and then we reach in the fridge and have something when we get about 8.30. Um, after that, what we have leftovers from the dinner before, canned sardines or mackerels, then another time at 11.30 and 2.30, this is ballpark, and then uh, dinner at 5.30. If anything, maybe I eat, I overeat protein, I don't know. It's when you kind of just focus on protein, whole food sources of protein, you don't have much to worry about. You're pretty good, especially then at the weekends you work on your, your organ meats or you're on a multi. Okay, level four, precise. All right, now we're going to get into two variables that I think are very important. Uh, I, I don't know if you call this a hack. I don't like that word. Um, here we go. So now we're specific protein types per day. There's a thing called the leucine trigger hypothesis. The leucine, which is an amino acid, trigger hypothesis. So here's a graph here. Notice the, the black and the beige and the blue of high dose, moderate, and low dose of leucine. The leucine is known to trigger this thing called mTOR. And that's what stimulates building things. It's the opposite of, of starving, right? We talked about uh, AMP kinase, that's the starving mode where you break down things and you get the bad, you take out the garbage. This is about building things up. So you can't always be in autophagy and taking things down. You got to build things up. You need some strength to go on. You need to be strong to go on to the next day to, to carry yourself through. So the leucine trigger hypothesis, it needs to be high enough. So you can't just eat protein, but you need to have enough leucine that really singled it down to half of what you need at least is leucine. The other is the rest of the amino acids, of course, because you need all your amino acids to make muscle and enzymes and so on and so forth. That's what your white blood cells are. They are protein. Okay then. All right, so the leucine trigger hypothesis is that if, if the leucine that you're eating, that you're consuming, is not high enough, you will not stimulate muscle mass. You will not stimulate MPS, muscle protein synthesis. So it really needs to be higher, or it needs to be high enough. And as you get older, you can guess that that threshold gets a little higher. You got to need to eat a little more leucine. Okay, so where do we find leucine is the question, right? Leucine, here's some, some studies here that would be interesting. Leucine-enriched proteins, when integrated into a low protein-containing diet, you're right, it's if that's one gram per kilogram per, uh, per pound of ideal body weight, this is probably about kilograms, so it's not very much at all. But when integrated into a low protein-containing diet, 
enhances rested and exercise muscle protein synthesis in older women. And this just compares fasted, rested, exercise. And look at the difference. So the darker blue boxes are the leucine. So even at rest, there's more muscle protein synthesis because you're having enough leucine. And exercise is even more dramatic. So leucine plus exercise, so appropriate amount of protein, the right kind of protein, which is leucine plus the rest of the amino acids, the eight or nine essential amino acids. There's leucine and there's mTOR, and we're not gonna go into all that, but um, it is worth knowing that you now know that leucine is the trigger. So when they talk about a leucine hypothesis trigger, they're talking about triggering mTOR to stimulate muscle growth. Okay, so are we talking whole food sources of protein? Or are we talking a slurry of protein powders? And uh, let's get into it. Here is a neat uh, link that allows you to look up nutrition in various things. Is it perfect? I don't think so. It's probably off by a little bit, but I use it because it gives you a great idea. So here's the link up top, and um, it's in you know what my food data is. We're going to go to this right now. Okay, so now we're just basically uh, on the internet, and I wanted to show you this particular link because it's pretty neat. So I punched in leucine and in fish. So it's, what's the highest um, sources of fish? It's tuna. The only thing bad about, I love tuna, and who doesn't love tuna? It's fairly high in mercury, and sort of, you sort of have to work your way around that. Unfortunately, we can't just be talking about what's the healthiest thing to eat without talking about some environmental toxins. It's very clear, um, beyond a doubt. But anyway, so you could do that marginally. And then there's grouper, which is a smaller fish. What you shoot for are smaller ocean fish because they haven't bioaccumulated so much of the toxins. So is grouper smaller than tuna? By a lot. Um, there's more tuna, there's coho salmon, so that would be a great choice. Um, cooked sockeye salmon. Clearly, this is an appetite for the Northwest, where all the salmon is. So you can see salmon's there, and, and uh, yellowtail, the tuna's there. So it gives you a sense there. So now let's go up and look at, at meats, you know, where it's the highest loose scene containing meat. Up oh, wrong, there we go. We're gonna go, where's meat? There's meat. Okay, meat. So it says 113 meats, highest in leucine. It says roasted chicken leg, drumstick, thigh, and back. After that is skirt steak. After that is lamb shoulder roast. What you notice is that these are all animal sources. These are all, well, of course I said meat. <laughs> what I expect? Um, and I guess to be fair, you could do, let's see, let's do all. Let's do all. And... Um, all food groups and what is the highest? Okay, out of all food groups, it's still roasted chicken leg, skirt, uh, skirt steak, lamb. So there you go. Um, I thought that was important to see that this is not me coming out of my reference, but a tool online that is very easy for you to use and that leucine is really important. So be thinking about leucine. Okay, here we are back in the presentation. So we just looked at that rather wonderful reference to find out about um, leucine. And um, it's just nice to know what real food there is out there. What about powdered sources? You know, is, is that okay? Should, should we do that? Well, initially I was totally opposed to this. And by the way, for those who are thinking of that you're gonna be the person who's gonna have the chicken breast and the pork and, and do that, and then you're gonna have extra leucine in there to sort of like really amp you up, there is a rate limiting step, so you can't overdo it. You know, you can't just scarf this stuff. Uh, those who are really big bodybuilders, they eat five times a day. They actually bring in another, just before they go to bed, they have more protein, but that's about as much as you can do. You can't have twice as much at any given time to think you're gonna get a bigger benefit. You just have what you need and move on, you know? So make sure you have enough, the required amount, and we'll get into creating it, how you create a demand, and that's the bigger thing. Okay, so here we go. So one of the things that they you look at as leucine, is high in a number of protein powders. And so this is whey protein isolate. And there are two different types. Um, so the highest, what I want you to get from this is the highest is a whey protein isolate in terms of uh, leucine amount. But what's interesting, and here we talk about a leucine supplementation, 
um, intensive training. I'm not going to go through every line. I was saying this is an example of 1999. This is not new information. So 21, 22 years ago nearly that this was already out there. So this is not new. I hope you're hearing it though and you're receiving it. It's, it's pretty beneficial and it's pretty much uncontroversial. So people talk about, for instance, BCAAs, branched chain amino acids. <clears throat> branched chain amino acids are 76% leucine because you have uh, these are branched chain amino acids that are preferred fuel for the liver, if you want to think of it that way. That's how we got it in medical school. But it's primarily leucine. It's been hard when I've had clients to go find a leucine-only product. They'll say it's leucine, but it's usually a branched chain amino acid. So the point was and is, don't sweat the small stuff. There's a little bit of valine and isovalene in there uh, when you get these leucine, you know, these leucine-only supplements. I was half thinking of getting a um, custom uh, pharmacy to formulate a 50% uh, whey protein isolate with 50% leucine. That would be the ideal from the research that I've gone through and all the pages and so on and so forth. That would be the ideal. But you can get pretty close to that if you got a whey protein isolate with leucine, which is going to be probably branched chain amino acids added. If you can get to a 50-50, um, that would probably be the most ideal. However, you have to think, if this is the only thing you're going to eat, then that's fine. That's how you would do it. If you're already having real food, and there's a reason for real food, we'll get to in a second, that this could get you in trouble if this is the only thing you're thinking about. So if you think you're thinking for a, a month or two, this is all you're going to do to drop that extra weight, to look real buff, you're probably going to uh, get into some sort of shock for your body. You just don't have enough fats, you don't have enough right fats, and you don't have enough nutrition. So for the short term, three to five days a week, four weeks a, a, a month, you can get by with that. But if you're thinking for a longer period of time, you are going to get yourself in trouble. Take it, you're going to get yourself in trouble. So think about whole food sources of protein first that we've already talked about, and then when you've calculated that out, if you still have need for more, this is an easy way of doing it. For instance, right before bed or something like that. Let's continue. Another, uh, another study, whey protein isolate attenuates strength decline after eccentricity induced muscle damage in healthy individuals. It's basically whey protein. So it does help. It's a big deal. You don't have to be a bodybuilder to, to use this kind of information. Okay. What else we have? Egg white. Hydrolysate reduces mental fatigue. So people often think, well, why should I use egg white? Because you get an egg white powder. That's what Judy cooks with a lot for her uh, egg white bread and so on and so forth, mixing that with actual egg whites. So egg white by itself has its own value. I will say this though, egg is one of the top five most allergenic foods out there. You have you have dairy, you have wheat, you have soy, you have corn, you have peanuts, um, and egg is, I think, number six or seven in there. So for some, you might not be able to do egg whites or have eggs. You have to go pivot to something else, okay? Hence the multivitamins that they're out there. All right, now is the second. This is after leucine. The thing you need to think about are omega-3 fatty acids, otherwise known as fish oil, otherwise known as EPA and DHA. DHA is 20% DHA is of your brain. Um, it, these are fats, right? And if you believe that we evolved eating primarily fish and so on and so forth, as Dr. Stephen Covey did up in Canada in that interview I did with him, that you realize this is really important. But in this context of building muscle or a muscle protein sparing modified fast, it is important because A, it sensitizes your insulin, and B, it sensitizes your muscle to be able to use fat. And that's the whole point of protein sparing modified fa fast, is to get your muscles to burn fat and not to burn glucose. That's where we drop this fat. We're burning it up. So the omega-3s has a lot to do with that. That's really, really important. So if you want to call this a hack with the leucine, then it's a hack. I would say that's why when you saw on that list of high leucine animal products, you saw salmon. That's amazing. Salmon is also, if not the highest, one of the highest animal sources of 
omega-3. So they're like a perfect meal. And here we are. It's an ocean fish. All right. So potential benefits of fish oil for bodybuilding. What is it? Reduces muscle soreness after workout, improves workout quality, prevents muscle soreness due to aging. It's a big deal. Those are all studies. Instead of me going to all that, I summarize it here. Okay, so the takeaway message is our leucine is a key amino acid for stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Lower doses of protein can be made, um, it can be more anabolic, meaning more building, more building of muscle when you mix it with leucine, right? The MPI, the whey protein isolate combined with leucine, that would be a really, that would be a hack sort of, that would be a very efficient way of making muscle mass. The integration of higher leucine in a lower protein diet stimulates MPS. Okay, some of the things we do, here's what we do, is that this is the uh, sausages. We'll be making a film of this later. So these are the chicken sausages. So it's ground chicken mixed with herbs from our garden, cooked up. So now we have these uh, in the refrigerator on a regular basis. So how much this is Judy's calculations. We know that ballpark, they're 22 grams of protein per burger. You reach in, there's 22 grams. What's nice is, remember, we heard about 20 grams was the minimal you need. Or if you take your daily amount and divide it by four, or however you're going to eat it, at least have 20 grams. There it is. Done. Reach in and grab it. <laughs> you're over. Really not a lot to eat. Okay. Takeaway message is the dose of protein that maximally stimulates MPS in younger men, following load is 20 grams or a, the 0.25 grams per protein per kilogram body weight. The dose of protein that maximally stimulates older men is twice that, 40 grams or 0.4. Age-related or immobility-related anabolic resistance. So if somebody's in the hospital, that's a perfect situation to have that whey protein isolate combined with leucine. At least they won't be atrophying as fast as somebody who doesn't have that. Really important in those situations, absolutely. Especially when you get older, if you're losing muscle mass, it takes a lot more to get that back. So if you can keep them when they're in the hospital for whatever reason, or you know they can't get out of bed, that would be a big deal. It'd help them a lot for the subsequent years to come. Okay, level five. Expert, creating the demand for muscle protein synthesis. Focus, adding resistance training to create a demand, a need to build muscle mass in a protein sparing modified fast. Slow, high intensity weight training, HIT. You know, muscle mass is the thing that's gonna be eating your fat. And muscle mass is like a fire pit, size matters. It determines how much fuel you can burn, even when you're not exercising. Okay, so there's the three times a day we're eating. We talked about increasing the appropriate amount of protein, right? So that's what made it more efficient. Now we're more muscle protein synthesis, a little bit. But what else can we add? We add in working out, and look what it did. Absolutely, it changed that a lot. Look at the, this is the decline. This is the breaking down of uh, protein. This is the building up. Now we simply add in HIT, resistance training, what a difference. Now you're mostly into protein synthesis and a little bit into protein um, breaking down. Okay, with resistance exercise, variations in protein synthesis are greater in the fed state and decline less in the fasted state. So just by exercising, you've tipped it in your balance. Just by exercising. It means even when you're not exercising, you're not breaking down muscle mass as fast as you ordinarily would be breaking it down. Okay then, here we go, absolutely. Etch this picture in your mind. And if you really want to figure it out, the longest break of muscle breakdown is when you go to bed. And so for those top athletes, they even work in a fifth time to eat. But unless you're you know, an American football player, high season, I wouldn't worry about it. All right, now HIT. Why does HIT work? High intensity exercise. And this is a, a slide I took from Dr. Vincent Benchicchio, what a great name, huh? Who's um, pretty much the originator of HIT back in the 60s. And here we are now, that's 40, 80, 60 years later. Seen him speak a couple times, great guy. So you have to push it, it's very slow. You have to push it to the point that you trigger your adrenal glands and cortisol to get out there and help you. You know, it's the idea that it's almost fear-induced in that sense. Very uncomfortable. You have to hit threshold. 
And after that, for the next 48 hours or so, this is why they say, wow, you're still even making protein, building up your muscles, even when you're not working out, because you hit threshold when you're doing HIT. And by the way, this has nothing to do with the actual number of weight. HIT was alleged to have started with osteopenic women. Go slow so they wouldn't break the bones. But then they realized actually it was much more efficient. Not going to go too much into it, but that's me doing it with my CGM on. And here's what that looks like with the CGM. You can see that spike. That spike is glucose going up because I triggered my adrenal glands, cortisol, to go to my liver to make more gluconeogenesis because it needed to feed my muscles. And you would do that too. Okay then. So now we combine the ideal frequency of protein intake with the ideal way to create a demand for muscle protein synthesis. Put both these, to these together, that's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. All right, here's looking at just working out and being fed. So this is a this is muscle protein synthesis over here, right? Going up is more and then it declines. So let's just look at this line, exercise alone. You work out, this is just resistance. It's not even hit. Hit would even be a higher one. So you stimulated it. Now you're going to go into synthesis and it takes a longer time, 48 hours for that to decline back to normal, more or less. 48 hours. So now you add in the uh, now you add in exercise and feed. So here's your exercise and you fed. Look how you've stimulated it even further. The times, this is just eating alone. I won't say spiked. Increased it. Plus the increase you did by exercising. Increased it. Increased it. Isn't that amazing? Okay, this is more of the same. This is uh, mixed muscle protein synthesis and breakdown after resistant exercise in humans. Just go with the obvious. When you work out, you, your resting period does not decline. You know, your, you can say your basal metabolic rate is higher. That's part of it. But your muscle synthesis is higher across the board. So this is without working out, and that's after having worked out. Okay, summary. Level one, lean sources of protein three to five times a day. Track what you have. Learn to weigh your protein. Two skills that are going to serve you well. Level two, how to calculate your required amount of protein per day, right? Ideal body weight, don't be insulted with that. It's just a term we use to calculate your body weight. So for instance, there's a man who joined our Facebook group that weighs 500 pounds and he's about my height. He is just eating the same amount of protein that I would eat, assuming we're both 5'10". So that's it. So because he's heavier, he's not gonna be eating more protein, okay? Uh, regardless of what the weight is. Okay, level three, learn when, you, uh, learn when you have your protein each day. Four times a day is ideal. Level four, learn to have the highest sources of lutein, leucine in your protein each day and your fish oils, omega-3s. Level five, add HIT, H-I-T, to create a demand for maximum muscle protein synthesis. And that's everything. Talk to you next time. Take care.